We're continuing our conversation with Christian Picciolini, who's founder of the Free Radicals Project, host of Breaking Hate on MSNBC, also author of the book White American Youth. So in part one of the interview, Christian, we talked about how you got into the neo-Nazi skinhead movement and some of the sort of characteristics of folks that are particularly drawn to it and targets for recruiters. Before we get into how you got out of the movement, I'd be interested in hearing a little bit about how you see what's going on today. We had the one year anniversary recently of the Charlottesville, Virginia rally that led uh, to the death of one woman and many injuries, uh, a, a rally about which the president of the United States said there were very fine people on both sides, including the side that included neo-Nazis and white supremacists. Do you see the current resurgence as directly connected to who's in the White House, or is it more complicated than that? I think it's slightly more complicated than that, but I will say that, uh, you know, the election did uh, kick over a bucket of gasoline that was already, that kind of ignited all the small fires that already existed around America. Um, you know, I, I certainly think that, uh, I, you know, we can refer to the statements made by the white nationalists themselves, uh, from David Duke to Richard Spencer to Matthew Heimbach to, you know, many of the prominent leaders within the white nationalist movement who came out and said, you know, we've elected our man. Uh, you know, we're excited about the policies that he's implementing, uh, you know, from building a wall to a Muslim ban to, uh, you know, tearing uh, families uh, away from each other and deporting them. Uh, these are all these are all white nationalist talking points, and they were thrilled uh, when uh, Trump was elected president. Um, you know, hate crimes have have been up. I mean, the statistics are all there. The facts, uh, you know, can't be ignored, and certainly some of the policies and the words that he's used himself can't be ignored. So, uh, you know, I, I certainly think it has fueled. Uh, I don't know if we'd call it a resurgence, but it's it's certainly uh, it, it's bigger, but it's it's more that it's come out of the shadows uh, than it was. Trump did not my create sense has racism. Been, my sense has been that there's not so so much more or new white supremacists and neo Nazis, but there's more comfort in just kind of saying that those are your views and in demonstrating publicly. Do you agree, or do you think that there, there's actually individuals who are entering the movement as a result of what's going on? Oh, I think there are absolutely more people entering the movement as a result. Oh, you do. Um, That's much worse yeah, than I, I was hoping. <laughs> well, well, they're, you know, the tactics have changed and the platforms uh, with which they they reach people have have changed. So I think the Internet is really uh, it, it's kind of like my digital alley. Right. Uh, you know, for so many young kids, you know, kids who feel marginalized rather than going to smoke pot in an alley like I did are now going to hang out in chat rooms and in forums and, and uh, you know, places like 4chan and Reddit. And in those places, they're starting to see these very kind of benign, uh, you know, white nationalist recruiting uh, lures, uh, like I saw, you know, things about identity politics and, and uh, you know, black on white crime statistics that are falsified and, and even skepticism towards the Holocaust. So it's not, you know, the, the new wave of this kind of pseudo intellectual, pseudo philosopher thinking that's influencing so many young people, both on the internet and in real life, you know, they're, they're not calling themselves Holocaust deniers. They're not calling themselves white nationalists. They're skeptics. They're scientists. Uh, they're philosophers who are just searching for the truth. And that's the way they hide, uh, you know, the racism and the ideas that they're trying to push. And so many people, David, are, are falling victim to this and, and they're not white, not all of them. Yeah, Some well, that's what I Jewish. wanted to kind of ask about, because you mentioned the idea of people who don't even realize that even if they don't consider themselves part of any of these movements, by their mere sort of acceptance of some of the ideas they're becoming. And this isn't an insulting term. It's a, it's a term that has a specific meaning, a useful idiot, right? Someone who is right. without being aware of it, serving a particular purpose that they're not even necessarily connected to. What are some examples of that? Well, yeah, no, I mean, I think useful idiot is a really great way to put it. It's an intelligence term that means somebody has been compromised without really their knowledge uh, and they're being put to use uh, without knowing what they're doing. Uh, and, you know, and I think a lot of, uh, you know, famous uh, writers, people like Jordan Peterson or podcasters like Sam Harris and certainly, uh, you know, these kind of pseudo uh, philosopher types like Stefan Molyneux uh, mm. from Canada, uh, are, you know, are very good at hiding uh, the fact. And, and again, whether it's intentional or not, I don't know. They could be useful idiots. 
uh, although I would say that Molino is, is very uh, well aware of what he's doing and the other two may not be. Hmm. Uh, they're pushing these ideas that are uh, gateway drugs, essentially, to white nationalism. When they start talking about skepticism of the Holocaust uh, or the fact, uh, you know, based on the bell curve, Charles Murray's bell curve, that, uh, you know, whites and Asians have a higher IQ uh, because of genetics than than Africans and, and uh, other people of color. Now, Christian, uh, I mean, just so are, I know, because I haven't heard, yeah. of the people you mentioned, Peterson, Harris, and Molyneux, which which right. ones are doing the Holocaust skepticism? Because that I genuinely haven't heard from them. So Stefan Molyneux has several videos um, where he's talked about it, where he's, you know, he's freight I and mean, he's from Canada, too. So he has to be very specific about what he can and can't say about the Holocaust because uh, denying it there is part of their hate speech laws and he can mm. be arrested. Uh, but, you know, he's he's towed the line. He's come to it and, and posed the question, uh, you know, did did it? You know, I'm not quoting uh, but did it happen? You know, he, he kind of elicits people to think on it kind of with the notion that perhaps it didn't. Wow. Um, you know, I, I can't tell you how many parents uh, I get emails from that say, you know, I've lost my son or my daughter to Stefan Molyneux. Uh, you know, there was a point where he was uh, encouraging his his millions of followers uh, to defu their parents and defu stands for to uh, to remove yourself from your family of origin yeah uh, because he, th he thought that that you know parents were inherently uh, you know awful uh, for the development of children uh, I suspect he probably had a really bad uh, situation you know in his childhood that made made him believe that but certainly I would I would argue that you know parents are not awful for children unless the parents are awful people um, but you know, and he's always kind of shape shifting into this very nationalist, uh, you know, very kind of white nationalist uh, viewpoint. I mean, even so far as David Duke praising him and retweeting him and and and, and things like that. So he'll deny it uh, and, until he's blue in the face. But, uh, you know, I can tell you that for somebody like me, those aren't dog whistles. Those are bullhorns. I hear those things loud and clear because I used to do the same thing. I used to mask my true intentions and, and make the words a little bit more palatable for people to swallow so that I could recruit them, so that I could put my ideas in their head and essentially bait them so I could reel them in later. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately, I think so many of, of their listeners of, of Molino and, and Harris's and, and even Peterson's readers uh, are falling victim t to these ideas that are just really garbage science and, and, and very racist in nature. So you've talked a lot about how the pulling into the movement happens, either through the sort of useful idiot stuff or direct recruiting as you were d directly recruited when you were 14. Can you talk now a little bit about how you get out and maybe start with you? I mean, what what started to turn for you that you eventually got out of the neo-Nazi skinhead movement? Well, you know, having been born with racism, not a part of my DNA certainly helped. I mean, I, for every day of those eight years that I was involved, I questioned my involvement. Unfortunately, the, what I was getting from it in terms of, you know, this perception of power and this perception of strength, I started to become really in, intoxicated with, with it. Hmm. Uh, and nothing that presented itself, even though it was better, was, was powerful enough to, to draw me away until I started to actually meet the people uh, that I thought I hated. Uh, I had opened a record store in 1995 um, to sell white power music because that was the world that I lived in. I was in a band and, and was really all I knew since I was 14. And uh, but I also sold hip hop and punk rock and heavy metal to make ends meet. And, you know, I started to meet African-American people and Jewish people and gay people and Muslims. And, and all of a sudden, uh, not all of a sudden, but, you know, over time at the store, I had to deal with these customers and I began to realize that, you know, I had much more in common with them than I did with the people I'd surrounded myself with to boost my own ego. Uh, and it was really the compassion that these people showed me, even though they knew exactly who I was and what I was about and what I was selling in my store, they came in and chose to treat me with compassion. Uh, and it was the compassion that I received from them, when, uh, you know, the people I least deserved it from when I least deserved it. I think that was my most powerful uh, catalyst for change. I just couldn't reconcile my prejudice, the demonization that I had for these people now that I'd met them and had a meaningful engagement with them was destroyed. And it became, you know, it turned into humanization and I just couldn't deny um, the truth anymore. So I, and did you know, you I eventually talk about, did away. you talk about that with the other neo-nazi skinhead 
people that you were around? Did you say, you know, I'm starting to kind of question or, or was that was that an internal dialogue exclusively? Oh, it was internal uh, because, you know, there was always a fear of, of seeming weak or being vulnerable uh, mm -hmm. within the movement. You know, it, it wasn't something that <laughs> wasn't something that most people did. Uh, you know, you're talking about a bunch of, uh, you know, type A uh, alpha males or people, you know, or males who were trying to be that. And, uh, you know, talking about your feelings and, and your emotions wasn't always a good thing unless it was about anger and violence. Uh, so I struggled with it internally. Actually, you know, I struggled it for the last two years I was in the movement and I still couldn't leave, uh, even though I was, uh, you know, it was devastating me, uh, devastating me so much that I lost my wife and my children because of it, because I didn't leave the movement fast enough for them. Uh, they were never involved. Uh, and, it, you know, the lure of this kind of identity, community and purpose that I had found in the movement was was too strong. I didn't have the courage to, to walk away until, you know, I hit rock bottom and then uh, I really had no choice. And when you do that, is it a clean break? Is there I mean, is it easy to leave? I, I don't this isn't this is a poor analogy, but we've interviewed a lot of former Scientologists who say you don't just leave. Right. Like, I mean, there's physical right. things keeping you there. There are financial things keeping you there, et cetera. Can you just say I'm out and that's it? Yeah, I wish it were that easy, but it's not. Uh, you know, everything that I had was invested in that movement, uh, you know, much like the story of the Scientologists. And really, you know, becoming a neo-Nazi or becoming a you know, part of a white supremacist movement is really not that different than a cult or the Islamic State or gang uh, or a sports team or a religious group. I mean, it, it, it was the same type of draw. It was that, you know, sense of belonging, the sense of this is who I am and, and this is what I'm supposed to do with my life. Um, so it was very difficult uh, to walk away from that because it was really everything that I had ever known uh, and I had nothing to go back to. And the threat of, you know, leaving, certainly the physical violence was always there, but also the threat of not being accepted by, uh, you know, everybody else once you left was was always a big threat. Mm. You know, like drug users, maybe it's sometimes just easier to go back. Uh, and for many people, it, that's what happens, unfortunately, if we don't replace it with a new identity, community and, and purpose. Uh, and frankly, my struggle getting out, which I, you know, I had to uh, I, I had to question myself for many years. I had to do a lot of soul searching. I had to make amends and seek forgiveness uh, when I eventually found the courage to tell my story. Uh, it was a long process, and, and it's precisely the reason why I, I founded uh, the original organization, uh, Life After Hate, and also now Free Radicals Project, was to actually help people go through that that transition. And then it kind of morphed into proactively, uh, you know, inserting ourselves to try and get people to disengage. Last thing I want to touch on in the time we have left, um, there's sort of, uh, I guess to use an analogy, there's retail and wholesale strategies for getting people out of the movement. So Daryl Davis, for example, who we've interviewed several times, who's awesome. He has more of like a retail approach where he will go and individually hang out with KKK members and other neo-Nazis, et cetera. The Southern Poverty Law Center has what they consider to be more of like a wholesale approach where they are trying to dismantle the groups from the top down. Given all options, do you have strong feelings about what the most effective way is to disrupt or take apart these groups? Well, I think uh, both strategies are important. I think we do need to, you know, have a wholesale or a preventative strategy, uh, but we also have to, to, you know, treat the illness uh, patient by patient. It's almost like polio, right? Uh, you know, we have to treat sick people, uh, which is what Daryl and I do to a large degree. Um, but we also have to inoculate the population from getting sick, which is in large part what groups like the SPLC or the Anti-Defamation League or many of these other um, uh, groups that are, are countering hate do. Uh, and I kind of do a little bit of both. So my goal is really to educate people, um, you know, through different mechanisms like my talks, the TV show Breaking Hate. Uh, to be able to show people what they can do, uh, because I know that, you know, people like me and Daryl are, are far and, and few between, um, but that we also can, uh, that we can destroy this type of interpersonal racism. Now, I'm not talking about systemic or institutional, because that's a whole other thing that we need to tackle as well, if we want to see racism go away. But as far as interpersonal racism, 
Um, you know, this is something everybody can do so long as we can start to understand that ideology is not what is radicalizing people. Uh, the pre-radicalization happens from the day we're born and it continues through every situation that we have until that extremist group presents itself, at which point we're radicalized. Uh, so my pre-radicalization was fraught with abandonment and, and with low self-esteem and confidence issues. For some people, it's sexual abuse or uh, you know, mental illness, things like that. That is, th all those points of marginalization, trauma, those pain points that kind of just nudge us from our path, that is the radicalization process. The ideology, when it presents itself, is just the permission slip and the license to be angry. Uh, and, for, and for some people, uh, you know, they're lucky enough to never come across that, that uh, recruitment point. Uh, and they may go into drugs or they may get into prostitution or they uh, may commit suicide. It's all these other kind of destructive behaviors. But people in hate movements hate people, uh, not because of the color of their skin, but because they hate themselves. They're projecting their own pain onto other people, their own feelings of, uh, of inadequacy, of, of, uh, of, of, you know, whatever it is that's troubled them. These groups have given them the permission to project that pain onto other people. And for many of these folks, to feel good about themselves, making somebody feel worse than they do is sometimes the only way they can do that. Um, so, you know, I, I would caution, uh, but also I think it's hopeful that we know that. Uh, because if we know that it's these things that happen to us throughout our lives that cause us to go into these extremist groups that that essentially allow us to hurt other people, yeah. we can fill those potholes and fix those people with better social services, with better mental health uh, services and, and states. There are some states that don't even have that kind of stuff. I mean, it's terrible uh, sometimes to think how our system is really not serving uh, its citizens. But, you know, if we can, I, I think we can largely, um, I think we can largely solve this issue of violent hatred and, and extremism if we can fill those potholes uh, for kids at an early age. Christian Picciolini, founder of the Free Radicals Project, host of Breaking Hate on MSNBC, and you can also check out his book, White American Youth. Christian, I really appreciate you taking some time to talk to me today. David, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me.